<laughs> you know, somehow I, I just knew that John's introduction of me was going to be entertaining. <laughs> He's told you so much about who I am. That was the, the first thing on my little um, cheat cards here is to just tell you who I am and how I came to be up here. Uh, I'm uh, from Mendenhall, Mississippi, and I, ca <laughs> I um, came up under the tutelage of uh, John Perkins and company uh, in the leadership development program there. And I guess I'm, I'm up here because CCDA now is, is really trying to show people some results of the, the work that you do in your communities. I guess I'm a, I'm a product. I'm a <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to be a success story. But <laughs> um, that doesn't mean I'm a speaker, though. So. Um, a little bit, last year, right now I'm on the board of Voice of Calvary Ministries and I'm managing their health centers. Last year I came to CCDA in Birmingham to try to recruit physicians and um, nurses for our health center and I asked John if I could just have five minutes at the beginning or end of his Bible study so that I could make a pitch to people to come by my booth and talk to me. So uh, he said, okay, you got to hold it down to five minutes now, hold it down to five minutes. Okay, I'm up on the stage, I've, all the night before, I've, I've tried to get my little statement down to a concise pitch to get people's interest, interest up enough that they would come by my booth. Well, just before I walked up to the podium, John said, there's about 20 or 25 minutes remaining and we don't have anything left, you can talk as long as you want to. <laughs> and uh, I was mortified. But what I did is just uh, prayed a little on my way up in the three or four steps to the podium and I asked God to just give me some words. I ended up sharing a, a small part of my testimony and from that uh, Wayne informed me that there were people who were really, really moved and people did tell me that and wanted to hear more from me. Now um, they had, and John Perkins determined then that I would be a main speaker. I said, yeah, right. Okay, uh, they had trouble getting me. Uh, I would not return any calls when Donna, Donna can testify that because I, I said I'm not a speaker. But when I finally talked with Wayne, um, I really felt that through their prayerful consideration, through the uh, comments that people had made and people very close to me, felt like I had something to share. It's, it's hard for me to feel like I have so much to share because I'm not all that. But I prayed, I consulted with uh, close friends, spiritual mentors and advisors, and I um, consented to do this. Now, right up front though, I have to give you my disclaimers. I am not a preacher, so I can't take the scripture and just open it and, and illuminate it for you, okay? So don't have that kind of expectation. I'm not really a public speaker, and it didn't dawn on me until today People think I'm really smart because I'm a doctor, but I'm kind of simple. It took me a whole month to realize that I don't have to make a speech. What I need to do is just talk to you, and I talk to people all the time. That's really the major part of my job. And I can talk to you about what God has done in my life through this um, Christian Community Development Ministry, the model that was founded by John, the father of CCDA, Voice of Calvary, and give you some of my testimony and what I feel like God is saying to me now. So that's, with that said, have no expectations for a, an organized 3.7 point sermon or whatever. <laughs> Just, uh, I'm going to, to speak what's, what I feel like God has laid on my heart. The first thing I'd like to do is just read a scripture to you that has, um, that I believe God has given to me uh, over these last few months as we've gone through um, some real change and hardship at Voice of Calvary. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 reads, and now brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. 
Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And the day, they did not give as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And this is the verse that really speaks to my heart where I am now. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Let's pray together for a minute. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that you give us to serve you. I thank you, Father, for the call that you placed on our lives. I thank you for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your speaking to us in that small, still voice through your scriptures, through Christian brothers and sisters. And I pray, Father, your blessing on whatever we have to say tonight. I pray that you would just speak through us and to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, my, my mission tonight is really threefold. As I think about what it is that I want to give, I want to inspire the young. And I hope to do this, do, do this through sharing some of my testimony. Um, because, you know, when I'm held up as a success story, it's kind of hard for me. Because, like I say, I really feel like I'm not all that. If I can do it, you can do it. If God can me use me, he can use you. Like John Thomas said this morning, any old Joe can do some of this stuff. Uh, secondly, to encourage those are, who are laboring now, those of us who are in our prime productive years, to encourage you to continue in the work that God has called you to do. And finally, to motivate the elders of us, those like John said this morning, he's 68 years old, to motivate those who have been out there a long time to pass on to us the wisdom of their experience and of their years. Now, since I'm not a public speaker, I don't know how to bring all the things together that I want to say. I really have two distinct messages. So, since I gave my disclaimers early, I don't know how to put them in order, I'm going to give two different messages. They're both short, so you don't have to worry. That'll be a long time. Uh, the first is, is part of my testimony to hopefully inspire the young people in here. Uh, and to, you know, the title that, that really came to my mind is I'm not all that. You know, God can do this through any life, any willing heart, any heart that's placed before him. He can take and change and use whatever your gifts are. And he gives you gifts as he brings you into his kingdom. And um, the second part of it is just you have a reason to continue the work that God has called you to. I grew up in a Christian home. And I, the older I get, I, the more I realize is that's probably God's greatest gift to me. I had an intact family, a mother and father, and who were committed Christians and actually um, leaders in the community. I accepted Christ when I was 13 years old, and uh, still believe that is the time that I came into the kingdom. However, at age 15 was when I was really exposed to what I call this radical Christianity, this expanded view of what the Christian life really is, that it's more, more than just about my own personal soul salvation. And I came in contact with this whole view through Voice of Calvary in Mendenhall, through John Perkins. I uh, became involved in their le youth leadership development program, and they really made some investments in us. 
Um, one of the reasons I find it difficult to speak is because I sat under people like Don Perkins and Tom Skinner. They brought in people like that to speak to us down in Mendenhall, Mississippi, sitting in little circles in the rooms to, to tell us about what it means to be in the kingdom. Um, what it means to have a commitment to the poor, to look at the scriptures in a way so that you can see what Jesus spent his time doing, where his heart was, and to focus your energies in that place. And that is where I really developed a commitment to serving, to making sure that my faith is relevant to the things that I choose to do in life. That was a big difference from that you know, my soul is saved, I'm going to heaven after I die, kind of Christianity that I had um, just been exposed to. So this was uh, under that daily tutelage and that involvement, uh, my life and my view of my life as a Christian changed radically. It was then that I decided to go into medicine. And it was because there were volunteer nurses down there, one in particular, Vera Schertz, who formed a health careers club. And she spent time taking people like me out on home health visits with her and taking us to the medical center in Jackson to research labs, exposing us to different occupations that from, just imagine now, I'm a black teenager in a small rural town of about 1,500, 2,000 people, my view is very limited. So one of the things that this ministry did and the people you know, who were committed to doing this was broadened our horizons in a way that I think we would not have uh, been privileged to have had it not been there. Now, continuing on in my life, <coughs> When I was 17, although I was a Christian, I had a baby. I felt like a total disappointment to my family, to my friends, to all my spiritual mentors and advisors. I was a, always a successful and confident person, and this really completely shattered what I felt like um, I thought of myself and what other people thought of me and what I felt like I could accomplish in life. One of the lessons I learned through that though, through my family especially, through friendships and through the Christians that were around me at that time in leadership, I learned what a little bit more about what the love of Christ is and how it's beyond, so much deeper and broader and wider and goes beyond my sin and my sinful nature because I was completely restored and was helped and carried in a way that allowed me to regain and maintain my self-confidence and go ahead with my plans. So I went on to college and then medical school and um, and, and what I'm giving is just some of my learning experiences along the way to show that, you know, you, you have a call on your life, that doesn't mean you're going to go straight to the goal. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the way. Uh, I went to medical school and I had trouble during my first year. Couldn't put my finger on it. I've always been a, you know, an A student and just confident and I just was not functioning at what I knew was my own capacity. And I discovered about halfway through my first year what it was was the isolation, the total isolation and the non-personhood that I felt in this, uh, the university medical center setting that I was in. I was one of 10 blacks in a class of 162 people. And we had the largest set of uh, black students in our class. <laughs> the other classes had 150 students with two blacks in them. So uh, I, what I would notice is the same people that I sat next to in class and had conversations with about um, whatever the studies, the subject was, or worked on cadavers with and played and joked, I could pass them in the hallway these were white students, of course, because medicine is a white man's world. <laughs> um, and they would not see me. It's not that they would see me 
and refused to speak to me, they would not see me as if when I walked up on the stage, I did not notice this speaker here because it is a non-person. It is an inanimate object. That's the way. That's my experience. The first time I really felt racism in a way that affected my ability to function, affected what I thought of myself. And that was a good experience for me. Spencer and I talked about this several times um, during the last month of his life because he was trying to bring me back to a real interest in reconciliation. I sort of dropped it along the way. But I think that that's, that's why um, I dropped it because it, that was hard. <laughs> it was hard to be a nun person for a person like me. And, but that was a good experience for me because it helped me to face some of my own bigotry that I have toward my own people. I was one of those almost like a bootstrap person. You know, if I can do this, you, you know, people holler racism over everything. You know, you just need to, well, how can racism keep you from studying and passing a test? Well, <laughs> I saw that. And so it also pointed out to me how deep, how very deep it is. These were good people. I mean, these were the Christians. I'm not talking about those outwardly racist people. These were the Christians. These were the ones who invited me to their Bible studies. They did not see me when I walked down the hall. So the way I made it through that year, again, is, is through the body of Christ. I went back to my little integrated body at Voice of Calvary. And I just stood up and tearfully shared how I was just having difficulty and I needed support. And there, in that little integrated body, God used those people to minister to me and strengthen me so that I could make it through that year. In my second year of medical school, I was diagnosed with cancer. And that was a blow. I faced the fear of mortality, one that we all will eventually face. And I had to go on chemotherapy. And I, looking back, as I had to think through this, I know that it was the grace of God. I know that it was his use of specific people in my life and this body of believers that helped me make it through that. The thing that I learned from this experience was how to be a patient and what it means to be a patient. As I look back now, I see as I mature as a Christian that almost nothing in your life is accidental. I mean, it's, 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 it, it adds up. You know, God uses whatever, even if we bring it about, God uses whatever happens in our lives for his good, for our good and his purpose. So looking back now, I think some of the the things that, that people see in me when I'm trying to minister to them as, as a patient is directly from my experience being in a system where I'm just trying to live and having two or three doctors, one is interested in this part of my body, another this and another this, and trying to negotiate that system while I'm just trying to hold it together enough to hear what they're saying and follow the directions. I think God used that tremendously in my life. I made it through medical school, graduated, did residency, got board certified, started doing public health. And, and public health was just great because I, it's, it's working with um, poor people, working with the indigent, working in com communities where nobody else wants to go anyway, and uh, the government paying me to do it. So I thought, wow, this is great. I did that for years. And uh, somewhere along the way, I got married and had a child, uh, another child, so I have two children. Then uh, perhaps the most difficult trial of my life, the most difficult personal trial. And uh, it's hard for people to understand this. They think the cancer was. But uh, was that the divorce, the breakup of my marriage. To, to know and experience two people who are Christians who you know, where you think the Spirit of God will prevail in this situation, you know. Um, and to see the disintegration of my marriage really threw me into a tailspin regarding my faith. I 
really had to question the power of the Holy Spirit, question the, the relevance. Because, you know, I'm, I'm walking this path where I'm saying God is so relevant in my life that I'm making my career choices, my decisions about where I live, all this based on my relationship with God, and this marriage won't work. Well, I don't know how, but... God brought me through that too and my faith was not shattered and you know for three or four years in there I was I was kind of shaky but I know now that even with that God has used that because of all of these experiences that I've shared about God has used used it in my life to help me to minister to people in similar situations so now because of my history, I have a passion for teenage pregnancy prevention. That is one of the main um, uh, areas of focus as I try to minister in health care. I feel like what, what I can bring because of my experience, because of what God has done in my life is, you know, instead of a program, I can sit down and talk to girls and say, whatever. <laughs> I can just talk to them and they can hear and respond to me because they know I've been there. Been there, done that. Know what's better. And uh, that has been a blessing to me uh, because of some of the experiences that I had as a patient. I have, a, a, I think, a, a compassion. And, and I'm just saying this to to demonstrate, not to focus on what I can do, but to demonstrate how God can use anything in your life. And this is what I hope is inspirational to the young people in here. God can use anything that, that you've gone through in your life to equip you to handle what he has called you to do in the future. You can't see that when you're young. You can't see that when you're going through it. Perhaps you don't see it until 20 years later. But you know that in this situation you can sit here now and say these things to these people and believe what you're saying and have a passionate uh, belief in it because you've been there. And that's what it feels like when I'm talking to teenage girls. That's what it feels like when I'm talking to patients facing just uh, what seems like an insurmountable illness. That's what I feel like when I'm talking with other single mothers and um, also encouraging women in general in their roles. Now, that's the first speech. <laughs> the past two years, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay. For the past two years at our, our small Voice of Calvary community, we, we've had a lot of difficulties, a lot of change in leadership, and just, um, and then of course you know that um, earlier this year the loss of Spencer was, was, had a, was just a devastating blow to us all in different ways. And uh, I tell you, sometimes it, when we go through things like that, from my various roles in our community, um, as a church member, a board member, uh, the manager of the health center, just as a friend and, and sister to so many people in the community, it, it can seem like, you know, I, I'm over 40 now. I, maybe I just need to stop this because I look at my colleagues and I think, well, we went to school together and they're here now and I'm here. and so. I think about six months ago, um, God started to impress upon my heart why I need to continue um, and how I can do that. And, and the things that, that I believe he has given me uh, are three major points. One is to make sure that you're calling make your calling and election sure. Now, lest you think I don't understand scripture at all, I know that that is usually used in, in when you're talking about predestination versus free will and all this, but I believe that beyond the calls that God makes on every Christian, a call to righteous and holy living and a call to um, commitments of various sorts and being a part of a body and witnessing and all that, God calls us to
to various things. Maybe it's to uh, a community, a type of ministry. I believe God called me to health care. I fasted and prayed over it, and that was my answer. And, and you know, I, that was when I was a freshman in college. So I believe God calls us to, to various things. Uh, you know, it, it may be a city, it may be a type of ministry, it may be a specific ministry, it may be a person, whatever. But I also believe that sometimes we take on somebody else's calling because it's popular or they're persuasive or whatever. And I think we have to be absolutely sure that the calling is from God, that God is calling us to do this, to be this, to be in this place, to do this thing. I'll, I'll read uh, verse 8 of uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's see. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 10 says, this is when Paul is, is telling the church to grow in Christian virtues. In verse 10 he says, therefore my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. That, that really gives me an undergirding that I need in my faith as I, as I go along. As I'm tempted, uh, you know, I, I'm a physician. I get offers every day in the mail to these, you know, nice suburban practices and, and to some inner city practices where you can make a bunch of money. But we all know working in the inner city, everybody that's there is not there to minister. And if you don't believe it, you can just drive down Ellis Avenue in Jackson, Mississippi and look at all the finance companies and the pawn shops and the easy check cashing places. They're not there for ministry. But I, uh, there was one time that I made a decision in my career to take a job just for money. That was in 1995. So for the entire year of 96, I worked in a situation that I absolutely hated. And, um, you know, that wasn't the, the choice that I made to do that. I joined this, you know, up and coming, really high powered suburban uh, white group. And I was seeing, uh, I was doing patient care, and I like patient care, whoever it is. But I was not in touch at all with any, you know, poor patients couldn't even walk in our doors. And I learned from that experience, I made more money than I've ever made in that year. But I was more miserable and hated going to that job more than I've ever in any other situation. I, you know, I'm glad I did it though. I mean, it wasn't a good decision, but I'm glad I did it because I learned more about me and I learned about more about what God wants from me. And the thing that I know more than anything is I may think I want something, but if it's not God's will for me, I don't want to do it because that's the best place for me to be is in his will. The second point, so making sure your calling is your calling and not somebody else's. Uh, the second point is knowing that God will supply everything that you need. That's, that's where I was weak when I took that job. I, I guess I just didn't believe, you know, I'm getting older, I got, you know, I'm putting one child through college and I got another one. You know, my children are 16 years apart in age. <laughs> So I'm going through the, the whole process again. I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to get over here in West Jackson and all that? You know, <laughs> what am I going to have when it's time for Justin to go to college? Uh, and that, that's what led me to that decision. But again, I, I, I just have to go back to what I know. God's brought me through so many things. You would think, I'm like the children of Israel. I didn't understand it in the Old Testament. How they keep going back to those same things. I do the same thing and God has to show me again and again and, and remind me of those lessons. He's brought me through things. I, I'm a living miracle standing here today um, with the type of cancer that I had and the stage that it was. Um, 
I, you know, I don't know many people who was who are standing uh, today, and and so I should just know what God can do and how He has carried me so th through so many things, and that He'll provide every single thing that I need when it's time for Justin to go to college. Anyway, <laughs> so um, Second Corinthians nine verse eight says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all time all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work verse 11 says you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God this also confirms to me why God will supply my need. It's not just so that I'll be comfortable and make sure my child gets through college. It's so that I can minister. So, you know, it all, it's logical. I like things that make sense. You know, God is going to give me what I need because of what he needs for me to do for his people. So I can trust that all the more. You know, I can trust it just on faith, but also because he says in his word that he wants this work to be done, so he's going to supply everything that we need to do it. That's the encouragement that I want to give to people who are, you know, sort of in that laboring area now. You know you 35 to 55-ish year olds. These are, these are our <laughs> prime productive years, and every now and then you do think about, you know, am I building something? that I can live on, that I can, you know, when my children aren't little anymore and they need this, you know, the, the, the price for raising children is going up. So we know the sacrifices that, uh, that we have to make, but faith isn't faith if you don't use it. And so it's, it's, a, it's a faith thing, you know. That's, that's what it is for me. And, I, and you know, Remember now, I'm not a preacher, so you don't have to go home and live by this. I'm just saying what I feel like God has laid on my heart. <laughs> okay, so, so um, I believe that God has spoken this to me. And, and so I'm, I'm living on this. Um, <clears throat> the third thing that we have to do is to keep our eyes on the prize. And that is focus on what the ultimate result of all this ministry, all this Christian community development is, all this ministry to the poor is, all this investing your time and energy and money in raising up young indigenous leaders, all this that, that we all do. I mean, you all do it probably a whole lot more than I do. But the ultimate goal, I think, is found as we read further in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 12 and 13 say this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people that's that's just the direct thing that we can see we're working we're meeting needs but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God. That's the ultimate. That's our purpose here. Our purpose is to bring glory to God. And so our service, the, the, the reason that we need to continue, once we know that this is the calling that God has placed in our lives, and once we just remind ourselves, just, just repeat those things over and over to ourselves that God has brought me through this, that, and the other. He will supply everything that I need whenever I need it. Not everything I want, but everything that I need whenever I need it. Then we continue because ultimately it will result in praises to God because of what we're doing for him. And that's why I felt like God wanted me to share with you tonight. Thanks. Thanks.